Good morning. My name is James Deitch. Here this morning to talk to you about my final paper and my defense of, of my argument and my research question. Uh, I'm talking about the military industrial complex this morning, and, and basically I'll give you the three tenets of my argument, um, and it's a counter to another argument. I would maintain that politics is the dominant force in the, uh, in the iron triangle of the military industrial complex. The military industrial complex is made up of uh, the primary consumer of military uh, products, which is the Pentagon. Uh, Congress, as the government, controls the purse strings, and private industry uh, provides all of the material uh, in, in this relationship. I had read John Alex's work, The Origin and Nature of the U.S. Military Industrial Complex, and in his argument, he maintained that it was the Pentagon, as the consumer of these products, that drove and was the dominant partner in this relationship. My argument will contend that the dominant partner in the relationship is actually the uh, private industry that produces the weapons and the technology. Government can't do it. Pentagon can't do it. Private industry is necessary for the execution and delivery of the technology and the products. And throughout history, it can be demonstrated that they are the dominant partner and the controlling partner. Uh, it didn't originate that way, but remember in Eisenhower's speech in 1961, January, when he was giving his farewell speech, he, he warned of the uh, unwarranted influence and power of the military industrial complex. He also said that whether they had sought to have that influence or not, the end result was that they had achieved that. And, and so that's where my argument goes. Um, it, it also, the origins of the military industrial complex didn't begin with Eisenhower. It was a preconceived condition, a uh, pre-existing condition that could trace its roots back to the first time that a warrior asked an artisan to produce a weapon for him. Um, second emotions, politics, constituent votes, all drive military spending. Um, it's, it's more about jobs than it is about grand strategy. It's more about the economy than it is about national interests. And you'll see that throughout um, the examples of warfare. Was the American Revolution a war of ideology? Gordon S. Wood and uh, Bernard Balin certainly make strong arguments regarding the ideology of the war. But when you look at the Declaration of Independence and you look at the first 20 or so grievances contained within that document, you're going to see a lot of references to the economics of it. Finally, when you get into the 25th and the 27th grievances, you're going to trend towards propaganda of things that uh, were to come. For example, the Hessians, the ascending great armies armies over to us uh, hadn't happened yet. Uh, the Indians and the slaves were going to rise up in the 27th grievance hadn't happened yet, but they appealed to the common man. And so the emotion uh, of that drove the buying in uh, to why the revolution was, was fought. Um, in addition to that, I took a look at a number of different sources. There were uh, certainly the ideological uh, components of this, the theory, the ideas of who controls it. Here we can look to uh, the biographies of Robert Gates, John McCain, Leon Panetta, timely uh, biographies, but also the work uh, by General Smedley Butler, the Marine Corps General War's racket uh, was important to this discussion. Eisenhower's own speech was a primary source to direct us to the, the question itself. Um, and, and von Clausewitz was somebody that I looked at as to identify what war is. It's an extension of politics and policy by other means. Think about that. That's an important part of the argument here. We can go through each one of the wars and we can find economic indicators in maritime commerce in World War I, Lieben's room for, for natural resources in World War II, even the protection of the Michelin plantations, rubber plantations in Vietnam, Indochina, could be part of the economic argument as to it. But the significance of the research uh, question really is, again, designed to counter Alex's argument. And, you know, he was no slouch in this. He, he was a member of the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment from 1979 to 1995, respected academic at the University of Arizona uh, in their School of Future Innovation, very important to this discussion. Um, but I began with Eisenhower's farewell address and the, the idea of their unwarranted influence uh, over what is produced, how it's produced. And, and 
I looked at the F-22 and the F-35 programs, the fighter aircraft, as perfect examples of this because we had already achieved a level of superiority that far exceeded any of the competition uh, and, and continues to this day. And yet those programs were continued uh, not so much as a strategy but as a continuation of the military industrial complex's ability to continue to produce in times of peace and in war and be able to mobilize at a very quick pace. There was a lot of the justifications that went into my argument. And so those will be important. Now to go ahead and back up the trends, there are a number of uh, primary sources, databases that are available. Uh, I used the Pew Research Center, uh, usafacts.com, census.gov, uh, macro trends and other websites to look at the economic indicators. I've included a, a couple of those dra uh, graphs uh, in my paper itself to discuss that. In summation, the conclusion leads me to assert that the strongest member of the Iron Triangle is definitely uh, the private industry and not the military or government. The unwarranted influence that Eisenhower warned us of absolutely occurred. And my paper uh, clearly spells that out and successfully argues against Alex's point uh, that the military-industrial complex is alive and well and persuasive. Thank you. I look forward to talking about this.